this week as we approach worship, we're looking at the role and uh, work of the deacons among us. Uh, we will be in worship Sunday, uh, January the 15th, ordaining our two newest deacons. And we'll also, during that service, focus on uh, what that work is all about. There are several different places in Scripture that deacons are discussed. Uh, perhaps the most familiar is in 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, where Paul, writing about church organization, uh, first in that chapter writes about the uh, qualifications for the role of uh, overseer, uh, or uh, some translations translate their elder, but usually that is understood as the role of what contemporary church would consider the pastor. And then in 1 Timothy 3, 8 and following, uh, Paul talks about uh, the role and the work of the deacons. And there are other passages, and we'll look at them as we uh, make our way through Bible study today. Uh, but let's read together from 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, Paul says, beginning in verse 8, in the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, like the overseers, uh, as they are addressed in the first seven verses of this chapter, uh, deacons are to be people of quality. Uh, their function in the congregation is significantly different than that of the overseers, but their qualifications are very, very similar. Uh, the word translated deacon or diakonos in the Greek uh, language means literally uh, a humble servant. Uh, the role of the deacons is to uh, carry out under the elders' guidance uh, some of the more um, shall we say, menial task of the church so that the elders can give their attention uh, to other things. Each role is, is very important, but they are different roles. In Acts chapter 6, we get what is perhaps a someone called a, a prototype of what later would become uh, the office of the, of the deacon in the church. And I want to read those verses in a minute, but uh, to make sure that you understand where some of my thoughts, let me give you some of the people I'm I'm reading this week. I'm reading um, Jameson Fawcett and Brown's commentary, uh, critical and explanatory on the whole Bible, Ella Richards' teacher's commentary, and uh, Litvin from First Timothy uh, in the Bible knowledge uh, commentary, uh, as, as well as some uh, others. Uh, but those are the main uh, people I've read uh, prior to beginning this study. Uh, but let's look at Acts chapter 6, where we see what, as I say, one writer described as a prototype uh, of what would later become the office of deacons in the church. There's no uh, guarantee this was the first um, calling out of those who would be deacons. And in fact, in Acts chapter 6, th these are not ever called by the term deacons, but uh, looking at the role uh, of the, the seven that were called out in Acts chapter 6 and our understanding of what Paul described in 1 Timothy 3, we can see how that traditionally we have looked upon Acts 6 as a uh, description of what one group of deacons did. Now, during those days, and this is Acts 6, 1 and following, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. There were uh, Jewish Christians that came out of two different cultures. Some of them uh, were uh, out of the, the Greek culture and others were out of the more traditional Hebrew culture. And even though they were all Christians and were all Jews, uh, there was enough separation of them that their 
was perceived at least, and apparently the apostles took it seriously, so it must have existed. There was uh, some sense that there was discrimination against those out of the Greek uh, world uh, from those of the Hebrew world. So the 12 called together the whole community of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Notice here, they did not say waiting on tables was uh, something that didn't need to be done. They said that they had a different task to do. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, devote ourselves to prayer and to serving and to serving the word. So these seven were to serve the food. The apostles understood they were to serve the word. Both of these were necessary for a healthy church. Uh, so the, 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 what they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorius, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So this is an example to us of what has traditionally become uh, part of our calling out people to serve as deacons, uh, where we pray and lay hands on them, uh, indicating both our blessing on them and our uh, calling down of God's uh, blessing on them when they begin this service. An interesting side note here, uh, just to give you insight into the early church, uh, the Hellenist, uh, the Greek-speaking uh, Jews, uh, were the ones feeling that they were being um, overlooked in, in this very important uh, benevolent ministry of the early church. So when they uh, selected uh, the, the seven uh, to oversee this ministry, it's interesting that the church as a whole, apparently the church as a whole selected seven, and it may not be that obvious in English, but seven who had, who all had Greek names. So the assumption is that they called seven from among the Hellenist uh, believers uh, to make sure uh, that this issue got taken care of. Now, looking at the qualifications for the office of deacons, we see that those qualifications are almost as strict uh, as for the overseer. Uh, as like the overseer, uh, the deacons had a public profile in the church uh, and also the servant nature of their work. Uh, required strong qualities of maturity and, and uh, piety. Uh, deacons, therefore, must be worthy of respect. That is, they must have a, a seriousness, not that they can't laugh or have fun, but uh, serious people of dignity, not clowns, uh, someone has described it. Uh, and the same Greek term that is used here about serious uh, is used in verse 11. Uh, to address uh, the women uh, that are mentioned in verse 11. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Paul says these, these must be sincere people, and that is in the sense of being honest and uh, unhypocritical. Uh, and like the overseers, deacons must not be um, heavily uh, heavy drinkers. Uh, they, they need to have control of themselves in regard to intoxicants nor should they be greedy chasers after, uh, after money. Uh, but most important of all, uh, verse 9, deacons must be people of spiritual depth. Uh, we see this in, in Acts chapter uh, 6, verse 3. We read that a few minutes ago. Uh, specifically, deacons are to, uh, people who understand and hold fast the deep truths of the faith. Uh, Paul says in this phrase, with a clear conscience, uh, there must be nothing in the conduct of these uh, people that was uh, inconsistent uh, with what they profess to believe. In other words, they shouldn't profess one thing and, and practice another. Their words and their deeds uh, should match. Uh, in addition, like the overseers, who are to demonstrate their maturity before being placed in a position of responsibility. Uh, that's verse six. Deacons must also uh, first be tested. This is verse 10. 
Uh, now, Paul didn't mean some formal testing procedure, uh, but rather uh, that uh, these people proved their uh, their spiritual depth and their maturity and their uh, leadership quality. They proved it over time in the ordinary activities of life and ministry. Uh, so there was a sense that the church uh, observed the people around them. They observed each other. And when they observed someone who had reached a certain level uh, of spiritual depth and maturity and um, seriousness about the faith and about ministry, uh, and after they showed themselves uh, to be free from accusation, uh, that is, free from any kind of charge uh, against their Christ likeness. Uh, when that point was reached, if nothing was against them, uh, then uh, they could be called out to uh, serve the church in this role. Now, verse 11 uh, causes uh, a lot of people uh, discomfort. Uh, the many translations and uh, maybe yours does, uh, talks about the, the wives in verse 11, and certainly the term can uh, can be translated like that, but more um, appropriately, it is the word for women. Um, and Paul says here, verse 11, the women are to be worthy of respect. That is, they're to be uh, dignified or serious. This is the same word that is used in uh, verse uh, 8. Uh, they're not to be slanderers. Uh, uh, they're to be uh, temperate. Uh, some some say well balanced, uh, trustworthy, faithful in everything. Uh, so who are these women? Paul addressed. Uh, they don't seem to be. This would not be the women of the congregation generally. Uh, here in this listing of church leadership, Paul wouldn't have thrown a verse in uh, just at the at the women generally in the church. Uh, so they were most likely either the wives of the deacons or a group of female deacons. Uh, we know there were female deacons. Phoebe in, in Romans 16 uh, is, is called a deacon, using the same word that uh, is used here. Uh, and you can make a case for either. It's either the wives of the deacons or a group of female deacons. Uh, legitimate um, biblical scholars uh, even among the more conservative legitimate scholars, uh, do not fully agree on whether this points toward the women as female deacons or the wives of the deacons, because a case can be made for either of these two options. Uh, but as one writer uh, warns, being dogmatic about either view, and I'm quoting here, being dogmatic about either view is unwarranted by the exegetical data. That is the biblical text, both here in verse 11 and also the surrounding text about deacons and about uh, women in the early church. Uh, it does not support absolutely, unequivocally, one view uh, or the others. Uh, if, uh, if, if, if the wives of the deacons were meant, uh, they're... There seems to be no reason, no reason for the omission of the word there, T-H-E-I-R, uh, when in the same way it should be their wives would be worthy of respect. But that, that term does not appear here. Uh, also, the biblical text, uh, even so, uh, likewise, uh, this denotes a transition to another class of person. So uh, talking about male deacons in now verse 11, uh, even so, likewise, uh, we know there was, as I've already mentioned, Phoebe, uh, a deaconess. Uh, uh, naturally, after specifying the qualifications of the deacon, uh, Paul would pass to those in, in a similar office, uh, the deaconess. Uh, and some want to see two classes here. Uh, a class of male deacons and a class of female deaconesses, which don't have necessarily same roles, uh, but may have complementary overlapping uh, 
uh, ministries, and, and that argument can be made. But you understand that the Greek language, the New Testament language, unlike English, uses uh, endings to words to designate gender. Uh, many other languages uh, do the same. And so it would stand to reason that a female who is referred to as a deacon, uh, that the term deacon there in reference to Phoebe, for instance, uh, would be the term deacon with a female ending, uh, whereas other male deacons, it would be the term deacon with the uh, male uh, ending to the, uh, to the term. Uh, so it's it's hard for me to uh, argue uh, that these were two classes of servants uh, because of the uh, because of the difference. Here it seems that Paul requires the same qualifications for females or males regarding being a deacon. Uh, I mean, there were some modifications, as the differences of gender suggest, simply because of uh, the different uh, ways that the terms uh, come over uh, from the Greek language. One of the early church fathers uh, uh, in a letter, not a New Testament letter, uh, calls the ones that are mentioned here in verse 11, calls them female ministers, and we may understand them uh, that way. Uh, if I can do a side note here and, and chase this subject a little bit further, uh, in considering who is appropriate to be a deacon or to be in any form of service or ministry in the church, uh, review how the New Testament affirms the equality of women with men in the body of Christ. Uh, the first century was not a day and culture uh, that typically uh, accepted women in any role but subservient role. Uh, but look at the New Testament, you see this emphasis on women is very surprising. They were with the original 12 after Jesus' ascension, and they all joined together constantly in prayer, Acts 1.14. Uh, you see conversions of individual women that are noted um, in Acts 16, Lydia, uh, in Acts 17, Demarius. Uh, in other cases, scripture records that quote, not a few prominent women, quote, and quote, a number of prominent Greek women, uh, end quote, believed. Um, Paul ended his letter to the Romans with a list of notes to some special people in the church there, and a third of these are women. Uh, so uh, it would be surprising to one who understood the time and the culture of the New Testament uh, to find this kind of an emphasis on women, and certainly uh, the early church valued the role and the uh, the work of the women in their in their midst, uh, very different from their traditional uh, culture. So, verse. Let's move on from there. Verse twelve of First uh, Timothy three. Uh, like the elders, deacons must be. Uh, 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 in, in the case of the male, and they're being addressed here more specifically, must be one women men. Uh, it, it seems, and there may be more to it than this, but it seems to be definitely uh, uh, addressing uh, against polygamy and promiscuity. Uh, they're also to be capable managers of their own families. Uh, and then Paul spells out the reasoning behind this in verses four and five, is you can't manage your family, if you can't manage your personal life and those that are closest to you, can't manage them appropriately, then why would you expect to be able to manage the affairs of the church? Um, in, in verse 13, we, we uh, uh, understand that the position of deacon may seem by uh, cultural standards to be menial and unattractive. It's a, it's a servant role. Uh, but to the close followers of Jesus Christ, it looks very different. We First of all, we have Jesus' model of servanthood. Uh, but Paul uh, sort of summarizes here or holds out that those who um, fulfill their servant roles faithfully gain two things. First, they gain an excellent standing before their fellow Christians who understand and appreciate the beauty of humble, selfless, Christ-like service. And they also... Uh, gain great assurance or confidence, boldness in their faith in Jesus Christ. 
uh, humble servants service that lacks all of the rewards the world says are important, it becomes a true test of one's motives. Uh, here, uh, a person discovers whether or not uh, his or her efforts are truly prompted by a Christ-like spirit of selfless service. Uh, when a deacon has indeed served well, the ministry of that deacon's, deacon builds confidence uh, in the sincerity of his or her faith in Christ uh, and of an unhypocritical approach to God. Uh, so uh, the duty of the of the deacons, uh, someone is described like this, uh, coming out of, first of all, we understand the, the structure that Paul explains, uh, mimicked in significant ways the the organizational structure of the early Jewish synagogue. Of course, that was Paul's background. Uh, so it makes sense that he would uh, understand uh, this would be a good model. Uh, and so following the traditional organization of the Jewish synagogue, Paul spells out uh, overseer, deacon, and the, the deacon's duty, much like those in a similar role in the synagogue, their duty to was to teach the scriptures or read the scriptures in the church to instruct new believers in Christian truth, to assist the overseers at uh, the, the sacraments or, or the, the, we call them ordinances, uh, the Lord's Supper, uh, baptism, uh, and, and to preach and to instruct. Uh, they were to be involved hands-on in making sure the church functioned uh, properly. This was not primarily, though, about uh, budgets and buildings. It was primarily about making sure that people were growing in their faith uh, and that they were uh, preparing themselves under the guidance of uh, overseers and deacons. Uh, they were preparing themselves to be people uh, who ministered in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, finally, let's look at the 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 purpose of the church is to a reminder that the purpose of the church is to glorify God. We are meant to praise and worship God who is our Lord and our head uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, and our purpose is further to build up and encourage the individual members of the church. Now, God desires that we be whole people. And one of the reasons God has given us the church is to help our individual growth, uh, spiritually and otherwise. Uh, not every member of a church congregation will hold an office, uh, but every member is equipped to be ministering to others and exercising the gifts he or she has been given. So on what basis do we choose leadership in the church? Well, first we look at the qualifications for leaders that scripture sets out. We look at though we look for those that are mature, those who are ministering now in ways that leaders uh, are expected to do as they serve the people. Uh, we get rid of this notion that church leadership is some sort of a, a reward system or status symbol. Uh, instead, we seek to uh, affirm those whose gifts and calling demonstrate that they are God's choice for building up the church of Jesus Christ. And the more we mature, the more clearly we realize that we need one another and the contribution that each of us makes to the whole church. Um, so as we uh, come together this Sunday uh, to formally uh, acknowledge the calling out of uh, the two who will be ordained, set aside for uh, the ministry of deacon this Sunday, uh, let us look at them uh, as people who can help us individually grow in our faith uh, and who can help ensure that our church continues to do, grow deeper in the Lord and continues to grow uh, in regard to uh, service uh, and, and worship. Uh, so pray specifically between now and then for uh, Patsy Hammett and for Trey Gramley, who will be ordained uh, on Sunday. Uh, pray for the other deacons as you see them. Uh, we will make sure you see all of them on Sunday morning. Uh, pray for them and 
when you connect with your deacon, one is assigned to you or will be, if not already, uh, when you connect, pray for that deacon by name on a regular basis uh, as he or she seeks to fulfill the ministry uh, to which God has called him or God has called her through our church. Speaking of praying, uh, let's, let's pray for uh, each other as we uh, consider the prayer list that is before us. Uh, let me bring it over for you to see. And uh, okay, there we are. I'm going to scroll it on down so you can uh, get a better uh, look. And uh, uh, let's pray for these folks and these situations that uh, we're asked to remember today. Uh, Lord, we hold up our sisters and brothers who are experiencing um, significant health issues. We pray for Linda Gowan as she continues to, to deal with a, a, a series, a list of uh, physical maladies. We pray for Albert and Hetty Wolf and for Fran Kirby. We hold up Sandra and Grady Reinhardt. Continue to pray for Larry Bagwell. We pray for Ms. Uh, more, uh, Martha Janice Moore, and pray that she will be healing as she deals with the virus. We pray for Ramona Settle as she uh, seeks to physically fight off pneumonia. Pray for Bob Shearer that he will be healed from the broken bones uh, that he suffered in a fall. Lord, we hold up Jim and Barbara Berry, and we pray for Kay Ballinger. What each of these uh, brothers or sisters is facing something very specific, challenging for him or for her. Uh, let them know uh, not only that you are working in their lives, but that, that we as their church uh, hold them up uh, emotionally and spiritually. Uh, and in our love for them, uh, we link arms with them in approaching you for what they need from you. Lord, we also pray for our nursing home minister, members for Ruby McDowell and uh, Ramona Settle. We pray for Mickey Pruitt, Doris Wilkins, for Sarah Trout, Bill Cothran, for Alice Warren and Vonda Barnwell, for Duff and Barbara Wells, and for Betty Campbell. Lord, each of these men and women are important to us, and even more, we know they're important to you. Pray that today you will uh, show them your love in some very specific and powerful way. Uh, so that they will know that not only have we not forgotten them, that you have definitely not, and that you will continue to abide with them each day. Lord, we also pray for the family of Doris Walkowitz. Uh, we grieve her passing. Thank you for her life and her um, impact upon her church. And we pray also for Lawrence Mara and his family uh, as they grieve the loss of his brother. Be close to them uh, and keep them uh, both these families in your close care. We've also been asked, Lord, to pray for uh, Andy Lauder, uh, Betty Mitchell's mother. Pray that you'll bring healing to her body. And we pray for the family of, of Gary Pike. Uh, be close to them and uh, give them the strength that they need to work through their situation. Lord, we pray also as we approach worship on Sunday that we will do it uh, out of a sense that our chief end as uh, believers and together with other believers as church, our chief end is to glorify you uh, and to bring joy to you. May we do that even as we celebrate the uh, the call to, to service uh, on the part of uh, Patsy and Trey and the other deacons that uh, begin a new term of service or a new time of service uh, this month. Uh, as we do this, O oh Lord, uh, may we truly be um, evident to you uh, that we are worshiping you uh, appropriately, uh, guided by your spirit uh, in the truth of your word. We pray these things together in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank you for uh, coming together uh, today uh, during this time of uh, study. Uh, and I look forward to joining you in worship uh, Sunday morning again as we uh, ordain these two for uh, deacon service. Um, looking ahead, uh, I'm going to take a couple of weeks off and uh, just unwind a bit, get a little rest. 
And uh, so I won't uh, be seeing you in this format for the next uh, two weeks, uh, but look forward to being back with you uh, in this format uh, the first week in February. Uh, thanks again for joining with me. I pray God's blessing on you in a special way this day.